Thank you, Buck. Let's get this show started. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to especially thank Rochelle Christie for uh, sponsoring this and also the Dean of Students Office here at Wayne State University. And uh, uh, this was originally, uh, we originally thought we would have the privilege of uh, debating someone else who happens to be here, uh, a person I admire very much, Dr. Bruce Russell. So thank you, Dr. Russell, for being here. Um, but just because uh, we originally were talking to Dr. Russell doesn't mean that we ended up with somebody's second string. Uh, Dr. Sata is uh, uh, an, an amazing intellect. I've read a, a lot of his, his uh, scholarly writings. Uh, he is, uh, if I'm intellectually at this level, he's way up here. So we're going to hear a lot of vocabulary tonight that I don't even know what the words mean. So we'll have to ask him to explain a few things to us. Just to give you an idea, I randomly picked out one sentence from his dissertation. I'm going to read it to you. Because indexicalism doesn't require any particular means by which this lexicosyntactic context sensitivity occurs, indexicalism itself represents a family of more specific views on which specific means for the context of sensitivity are positive. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, well, the, the, the question on the table is, how good are the arguments for God's existence? And I thought a good way for us to kind of think through this is the way we look at, Dr. Sad and I are both, are both attorneys, and many of you are very familiar with the judicial system, some for good reasons, some for not such good reasons. Uh, but I thought it might be helpful if we use, we borrowed a little bit from the legal system's approach to deciding whether something is true or not. And we call it the burden of proof. And we're all familiar with the criminal, uh, the criminal version, in, which is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Just a minute, I need to set my timer so I don't run over the two hours that I've been allotted for this first. Uh. <laughs> beyond a reasonable doubt, we know for criminal, we also know that in order to get somebody arrested properly, there needs to be probable cause or reasonable suspicion. Uh, that's a higher standard than just some evidence. Um, and for civil cases, we know that uh, you must win by a preponderance of the evidence. Um, and then occasionally in, in some specialized areas, reasonable to, uh, to believe or credible or plausible is relevant. In some cases in my uh, world, uh, in the tax court, clear and convincing evidence is used as opposed to no evidence and an invalid argument entirely on one end and irrefutable proof on the other. I will tell you at the outset, you're not going to get any irrefutable, irrefutable proof from me. Maybe Dr. Sato will, will work something out, but I'm not going to provide irrefutable proof. Uh, but what we will do is we'll talk about some good arguments for God. We're going to go through four of them. One of them is broken in half. So intelligent design, supernatural argument, properly basic argument, and moral argument. And so we're going to just keep rolling right into intelligent design. And we're going to start with the anthropic principle, uh, which is a seemingly arbitrary and unrelated but enduring law, physical laws, all have a kind of strange and common characteristic. They are precisely the values required for life on this planet. Uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer uh, uh, said it this way. He said, we have just the right strengths, just the right characteristics, just the right configuration for everything to, to support sustainable life. And he, 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 re he referenced that as the fine-tuning problem. He's not the only one who calls it that, but he referenced it. And so you can, uh, we could go all night on the fine-tuning uh, examples, but we'll just do a few. We'll talk about gravity. Gravity is absolutely perfect. Uh, in order to hold the atmosphere down and allow us to breathe, uh, as opposed to having everything evaporate and we wouldn't be able to breathe. Uh, and also, uh, there, is a, there is a ratio of electromagnetic force to the strong nuclear force, which allows all of the interactions within the environment to interact. And if that sounds a little bit um, uh, beyond your reach, let me help you out. I brought in another expert that's going to help explain those two things. Um, so, uh, Did you know that if gravity were slightly more powerful, the universe would collapse into a ball? 
I did not. Also, if gravity were slightly less powerful, the universe would fly apart and there'd be no stars or planets. Where are you going with this, Sheldon? It's just that gravity is precisely as strong as it needs to be. And if the ratio of the electromagnetic force to the strong force wasn't 1%, life wouldn't exist. What are the odds that would happen all by itself? Why are you trying to convince me to believe in God? You don't believe in God. I don't, but the precision of the universe at least makes it logical to conclude there's a creator. Okay, at least makes it. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon. Well, that was young Sheldon. So, <laughs> um, so what he was talking about there with the, uh, the uh, electromagnetic force uh, as compared to the strong nuclear force is that if those weren't in the precise location that they are, uh, then carbon and heavier elements couldn't exist, chemical reactions would not be possible, Hy hydrogen could not form, stars could not shine. So basically you have this slim, thin little sliver of 1% that makes it possible for life to be sustained. There are other, uh, other examples about mathematics and the, and the size of the Earth and the moon and the position of the Earth, the sun within the, 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 uh, the galaxy and so on. Uh, but those are just a couple to get you started. The tilt of the Earth, uh, the, the Earth's axis and the water distribution are perfect for the sustaining of life. The water cycle evaporation and condensation and precipitation and runoff are precisely what they need to be for the sustenance of life. The, the air content, when they, st they started to send astronauts into space and they put uh, figured out well, what kind of air do we want within the capsule and they started putting too much, too much oxygen in uh, and they realized, no, we got to go back to the same ratio that we have on Earth, otherwise the astronauts will be sick. So we need 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% carbon dioxide. Uh, we need a little, little trace of ozone and O3 and a few other things. Uh, and the core of the Earth uh, makes it possible for, elect electro for, our, for our cell phones, for our smartphones to work uh, because it, 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 the, the, the core of the Earth just, uh, helps balance and uh, give equilibrium in the magnetic field so we can have radio waves and Wi-Fi waves and everything else. Isn't that amazing? And somebody that, that kind of knew a little bit about some of these things only a few years ago was Sir Isaac Newton. And his comment, his observation was, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. So Sir Isaac Newton saw the beauty and the precision, and it spoke to him. It gave him a message. It, it was, we call it an inference, but to him it was, it was a loud and clear inference. And it's an inference that corresponds to what we find in, 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 in written scripture. We find in Psalm 91, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So there is the ability to learn from all of this precision about something much greater. Well, how do we fit that into our little burden of proof? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drop these in where I think they belong, and I'm going to, go, I'm going to let Dr. Sada knock them out or push them, back, push them up the, up the, uh, the, the scale a little bit if you can. But I'm going to drop the anthropic principle right in at clear and convincing evidence. That's where I'm putting it. Uh, and that's where we'll start. Uh, the other one is, uh, this part of the intelligent design is DNA information, which is a kind of a, a more, a little bit more specialized part of intelligent de de design. And it refers to the information bearing properties of DNA. As Dr. Stephen Meyer said, due in large measure to the discovery of the information properties of DNA, the materialist, that is somebody who is, who is not believing in the supernatural, the materialist understanding of life has begun to unravel. Scientists have become increasingly aware that there's at least one appearance of design in biology that has not been explained by natural selection. The information present in even the simplest cell. Even the simplest cell uh, has an information processing unit, it has a memory unit, it has a power unit, it has a sensor, it has a communication unit, it has an actuary and it ha an actuator, and it has locomotion. 
So the single cell molecular complexity, we could call it nanotechnology, a sophisticated information storage, transmission, and processing system at the heart of every cell. Well, if that sounds a little bit like just a repeat of the fine-tuning argument we've already talked about, it's, it goes beyond that because of the information. It's, it's like a computer code. In fact, that was, a, that was something I made up. It's something that somebody who's not known as being much of a theist, Richard Dawkins, observed the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. I don't know if some of you have written code before. Uh, but but that's that's incredibly complex. Apart from the differences in jargon, the pages of a molecular biology journal might be as interchanged with those of the computer engineering journal, Richard Dawkins. Somebody else who knows a little bit something about software would be Bill Gates. DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Uh, Anthony Flew, uh, for, uh, 30 years at Oxford is, is one of the most outspoken atheists before Richard Dawkins, Dawkins came along. In the final book that was published with his writings, uh, w w w instead of saying there is no God, it's there is a God. And one of the contributors to that volume is Paul Davies, and he wrote, the problem of how meaningful or semantic information can emerge spontaneously, spontaneously from a collection of mindless molecules subject to blind and purposeless forces presents a deep conceptual challenge. Uh, in 1981, Sir Fred Hoyle and Shandu Ramasinghe calculated the probability of a hypothetical single cell gene of 10 amino acids in length appearing by chance to be 1 in 20 to the ninth uh, to the power of 9 trials, which is statistically impossible. And so going back to, to, uh, to uh, Stephen Meyer, Theism explains an ensemble of metaphysically significant events in the history of the universe and life more simply, more adequately, and more comprehensively than major competing metaphysical systems. As we, as we read in Proverbs already, the heavens declare the glory of God. But notice this second verse. Day to day pours out speech, pours out code, pours out information that we can read and we can learn about. So I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to promote the DNA information uh, uh, to beyond a reasonable doubt, simply because of the science, the, 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 the uh, uh, iceberg, of, uh, the gl glacial iceberg of, of, uh, of science that's the, that's, that causes us to ask those kinds of questions. So we've done one, we're doing pretty well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm about halfway through in my time, so Seven and a half minutes. I got seven and a half minutes. I got to talk faster. I'm sorry. I got to talk faster. Uh, second one is supernatural argument. This isn't really an argument for God directly, but here's here's how this works. If you don't believe in the supernatural, there's no point in even talking about God, right? Because God is spirit. God is supernatural. If you do, if you do find that there is some evidence of the supernatural, however that evidence looks, whatever it looks like. Uh, then we have to ask a follow-up question. Where does God fit in? Does God fit in and where does God fit in? That's a different question than asking if there is a God. So naturalism or materialism would say there's no evidence of the supernatural or paranormal. And so atheists and agnostics suspend judgment on whether there is such a thing as God, a soul, ghost, demons, or paranormal, paranormal paraphernalia. But we can ask the question and... And I know the statistics of, of you know, the, a group this size. There are people in here who, there are people here who, who believe they they run into some some supernatural, paranormal uh, effect. Just statistically, it happens a lot. But we can ask the question: Are there some scientifically verified evidences or examples of paranormal phenomena, whether it's ghosts, demonic activity, psychic insights and powers, UFOs, witchcraft, voodoo? Is there some scientifically verified uh, examples of miracles or answered prayer? Is there some, are there some unexplained historical architectural mysteries? Uh, are there near, are there such, is there such a thing as scientifically verified near-death experiences? Is there such a thing as precognition or predictions or prophecies? 
Are there compelling visions, as in as we're we're seeing quite a bit in in uh, in, 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 in the Middle East? Um, are, there assist, are, are there psychics who assist police? Now, I'm not going to hold out this whole list and say everybody's got to believe in Sasquatch and this and that and everything else. But I am going to ask the question: Is there some evidence that any of this stuff takes place? And if there's some evidence that any of this, this takes place, now we're into the second question. Where does God fit in? Does God fit in and where does God fit in? So you can talk about Skinwalker Ranch. What? It was a, 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 a Pentagon-funded black bu uh, bu budget program from 2008 to 2013. Two, three different shows on uh, the History Channel, the show on Discovery Channel. Uh, there's a, you, you just, just Google Skinwalker Ranch and then ask yourself, is there something going on there? What about miracles? Craig Keener wrote a two-volume book a few years back on miracles. He followed it up with a book recently, Miracles Today. He posits that supernatural explanations, while not suitable in every case, should be welcomed on the scholarly table along with other explanations often discussed. What about near-death experiences? Uh, Dr. Eber Alexander's experience uh, in the seven-day coma that he was in where there was non, his, his uh, brain processes were completely non-functioning, and he investigated this as a neuroscientist. It's a fascinating read, as is. Uh, Jeffrey Long and Paul, Peer, uh, Paul Perry's book, when the, the, the near-death experiencer or others seek to verify what was observed during the NDE, the out-of-body observations are almost always confirmed as accurate, even if the observations uh, took place way far away from the operating room, way far away from where the body was. Uh, what about prophecies? We have biblical prophecies. Prophecies about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, being preceded by a messenger, going, uh, being in Jerusalem on a donkey, which the Christian faith celebrated just Sunday, this last Sunday. 30 pieces of silver, betrayed by a friend, hands and feet pierced, silence, silent before accusers. If you took only eight of those, if you took only eight of those, the probability of eight of them coming to, through, according to the math that's been done and studied and critiqued, is 10, 10 to the 17th power. Uh, which, uh, again, is, is uh, it's an unreachable number. The resurrection of Christ. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are the minimum facts that we can know about that event? He was truly dead. He was truly in an empty tomb. He did appear after his death and burial. Women were his first witnesses. To the, uh, there was transformation of his disciples. They recognized his, him as being the resurrected Lord immediately after the event took place. Not years later. Um, so we have this idea of the supernatural, and the Bible has a lot to say about the supernatural. It says you shall not go after other gods. That doesn't mean like like pretend little statues. That means actual gods, actual actual celestial beings or demons or whatever you want to call them. In their case, the god of this world, world is blind to the minds of the unbelievers. Talking about the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are finally to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So where do we drop that one in? I don't know. If we're talking about ghosts for crying out loud and demons for crying out loud and whatever. So I, I'm going to drop it in as reasonable suspicion. But it's not zero. It's reasonable suspicion. I got two more to go. Properly basic is, is basically uh, the idea that you don't need an argument for God. People can have a sense of godness, a sense of God presence, a sense of, of that there is God without an argument. An argument is not required. Just like saying, there's a tree over there. Yeah, well, you don't, you don't need to have a theory. You don't need to build up to that idea that there's a tree over there. You look, there's a tree over there. So we call that the census divinitatis. Uh, it's an innate dis disposition to form a belief in God, according to John Calvin. Uh, it requires common sense, foundations of rational thought, and presuppositions that there is a rational world, that there are other minds, and properly basic beliefs. Uh, uh, they are properly believed spontaneously, without evidence, resulting from the proper functioning of intellectual facilities. So it's a little bit like saying we don't really need good arguments for God. We just have God and we can believe in God, and there can be a sense of the presence of God in our lives. The, and, and even, even a tenseness or a tension. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Yes. We don't need 
uh, uh, to build a, a set of arguments for that. Where am I going to drop that one in? I'm going to drop that one in under, under some evidence. Uh, the evidence being that people have the sense of God. Okay, we're, how are we doing? Oh, no, I need a little more than that. Okay, all right. Moral law, I'll negotiate. If you want a little extra time, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Deal. <laughs> Deal. All right. The last one is the moral argument. And, um, and there's several versions of it. There's an evidential moral argument that starts out with the idea that moral facts exist. Uh, and then we say they have the property of being objective and non-natural. They don't come from us. They're just there. Uh, and that's 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 uh, and 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 that pr pr proves that there's something outside the human experience that imposes this or in in do imbues us with this uh, morality. Um, John Frame said it this way: Certainly, if the laws of the universe reduced to chance, nothing of ethical significance could emerge from it. What of ethical significance can we learn from the random collisions of subatomic principles? What loyalty do we give to pure chance? Uh, I talked a little bit about it in my book, The Gift of Dread, talking about the d difficulty experienced by many of those who reject God and the supernatural, that there is a, there is a philosophical, psychological, and spiritual disquieting. Um, and so that is actually a non-evidential uh, moral argument. The avoidance of existential dread is rationally necessary. It's not something that's good. We want to avoid it. You can only go for fully avoided if God exists, number one, and can provide atonement, mercy, and existential peace. It's the only way we're going to deal with existential dread. Therefore, God must exist. All right. So there are other examples of non-evidential uh, non moral arguments. I'm going to actually skip those uh, out of respect for, uh, for Professor Santa. Um, but here they are. Uh, and we're going to drop the moral argument. I'm going to drop that in reason, reasonable to believe. Uh, and, uh, and I'll skip a couple of uh, slides on that. That takes me to the home stretch. Here are my four, actually five arguments. Here's where I drop them in, in the, in, the, in the sort of where I think it makes sense for them in this sort of burden of proof level of probability. And I'm going to ask Dr. Santa to deal with them by getting rid of them or moving them upstairs to toward the no evidence uh, if if that's possible or if that even makes sense to be to to try to do that. Thank you very much. Hi, Brent. Thanks for being here. I promise to use very few of the words that I use in that particular sentence in my dissertation this evening. Uh, thanks to Raphael Christie and to Dr. Spaulding for having me here. Uh, so what uh, Bert and I agreed we were going to do was talk about basically four different kinds of arguments for God's existence and how good we think they are. He thinks there are various ranges of pretty good. I think they're all eh, not so hot. I put them in the, some of them I put in the no evidence category, and some I might move into the some evidence category, but lower than he does. A uh, little bit of useful context. Um, I'm an agnostic, is I'm using that term. That's someone who neither uh, affirms that they believe God exists, nor affirms the denial. My goal isn't to try to convince anybody that God doesn't exist. I myself am unsure about the answer to that question. Uh, and I would consider myself uh, an open-minded seeker. I'm not firmly forever in camp agnostic. I would like to think if I got really good arguments that God doesn't exist, I might become an atheist, or really good arguments that he does exist, that I would become a theist. Um, so that's where I am right now. I'm actually someone who continues to pray a fair amount. One of the things I pray for sometimes is uh, insight into the truth. Uh, and I think if God does exist, he probably wants me to be honest about how good I think the arguments are for his existence. So what I'm going to do is just try to truthfully explain to you why I don't think any of these arguments are particularly great. Um, so we've got four arguments, but in a way it's really five, because this first category, the design arguments, uh, I see two kinds of design arguments that Dr. Spalding has given. One from fine-tuning, and then one uh, which we might call either an intelligent design argument or an irreducible complexity argument. So I'm going to start by saying a bit about those things. Okay. So 
Uh, oh, one other thing I do want to clarify is just what I mean by God. Uh, so, Bert and I talked about this before the debate, and we agreed that we roughly meant by God we mean an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good personal being who created the universe and is worthy of worship. Why is it worth clarifying that? Well, because some people mean very different things by God. The philosopher Spinoza said, yes, I believe in God, but by God, he just meant nature. It'd be a very different debate if we were debating about whether or not nature exists. So it's good to sort of clarify our term, what we mean when we say whether or not God exists. So that's what I'm going to mean. Okay, so the first kind of design argument that Dr. Spalding talked about was the fine tuning. This is the fact that certain physical parameters of the universe are set up so that we could actually exist. As young Sheldon was saying, if gravity was a lot stronger or a lot weaker, we wouldn't be here. And that feels like something that needs explaining, right? And one possible explanation is the reason the physical laws are the way that they are is because God made them that way. That could totally be right. I'm not ruling that out. But the reason I put this argument just in the sum evidence category is because there are a number of other explanations that have been offered for why the physical laws might be the way that they are to sustain life here for us. The first is the multiverse solution. So if it turns out that the multiverse theory is right, and there are in fact um, you know, trillions, maybe an infinite number of universes, all of which have different physical laws, then some subset of those universes will have the right sort of physical laws to allow for human existence, and a bunch of others won't. But if we're just one universe amongst many, then it's not so surprising that there would be some universes that would allow for life. But you might think, why would it be our universe as the one that allows for life? And here I can appeal to number three, this observer bias solution. So I'm gonna borrow an example from a philosopher. Imagine that you're at a lake and you're trying to figure out how big the fish in the lake are. And you take a net and you put it in and you catch a bunch of fish. And they're all 10 inches or bigger. So you conclude, ah, it must be the case that all the fish in the lake, or at least it's pretty good odds, all the fish in the lake are 10 inches or bigger. Now, come to find out that you have a bunch of holes in your net that are about 10 inches big. Suddenly, it's not so mysterious that all the fish would be 10 inches or longer. There was a sort of bias in the data you collected because of the holes in the net. Similarly, for us, we're only ever going to observe human life in universes that are designed for human life to exist, right? You couldn't possibly pop into existence in one where the physical constants don't allow for you to exist. Uh, so there's a sort of selection bias that happens here. It can seem really surprising that we would end up in a universe that has physical laws that would allow us to exist. But if you stop and think about it, you couldn't possibly exist in a universe that didn't allow for those laws. So I think that makes it less surprising, uh, and therefore it's stronger data, or it's weaker data, the point to me. Finally, um, some philosophers talked about what's called multiple realizability which is the idea that life could have developed under very different circumstances from the sort of conditions we developed in. And if that's right, then suddenly the fine tuning isn't quite so fine tuned for life because life actually could have developed in much of different other ways. I'm not a scientist, so I can't really weigh in on how plausible that is, but it's one of the theories that's out there. Um, the second kind of design argument that Bert talks about uh, I categorize this as a form of irreducible complexity argument. So this one was when he was talking about DNA and how extremely impressive it is. He gives several quotes from a book from uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who is a historian and philosopher of science. And what Meyer's doing with those quotes is he's trying to say something like, look, God had to be the creator of life because it's so complicated. It couldn't have come into existence some other way, like through evolution. Um, so here's the thing, though, about irreducible complexity arguments. They're mostly offered by non-experts in the relevant areas of science. And those non-experts tend to deny the conclusions of those with genuine expertise in the relevant fields. So I'm going to give you a sort of, I think, good rule of thumb. For most people, most of the time, the best thing to do in such circumstances is to defer to experts in such disputes. Think about how you operate in your ordinary life. You probably defer to your doctor or your plumber or your mechanic when they have a lot more expertise in the relevant area than you do. When it comes to something like how DNA works, the scientists, they certainly have more expertise than I do. Um, or Dr. Spaulding, neither of us are scientists. 
So unless you're someone who is a trained scientist in the relevant areas of re evolutionary biology, you have good reason to defer to what the scientists are concluding in these areas. And this is for a general sort of reason. Experts are people who have a high degree of confidence in certain fields. They gain this confidence through things like experience, education, training, and practice. And because of this, experts are typically more knowledgeable in their areas of expertise than our lay people, which gives us good reason to defer to their expertise. Most relevant experts reject irreducible complexity arguments. They think they're not good because they don't think the things are in fact irreducibly complex. So I want to give you just one example because we've only got so much time. Uh, but I want to give you a little context about who this figure is here. Dr. Gail Falk is an evangelical Christian. He's a pr retired professor of biology at a Christian institution, Point Loma Nazarene University. And here's what he has to say about Dr. Meyer's arguments. He writes, Meyer's critique of the origin of life in evolutionary biology has significant inaccuracies. For example, in discussing the hypothetical RNA world and the origin of life, Meyer writes, to date, scientists have been able to design RNA catalysts that will copy only about 10% of themselves. He then references a paper from 2001. However, the field has progressed quite well in the past 20 years. He also writes, one of the mysteries that, according to Meyer, neo-Darwinism fails to explain is the evolutionary transition from the fins of fish to the limbs of land animals. This and other challenges like it is simply no longer the mystery that he thinks it is. I want to remind you, this is an evangelical Christian who's writing this. Lots of evangelical Christians believe in evolution, and they think that's totally compatible with their faith. And they don't think these things are clear evidence that God must have created. At the end of the day, the interesting thing is Dr. Dale Frank does believe that God created the universe but he doesn't believe it because of irreducible complexity arguments. He doesn't think those arguments are good. So as a non-expert, I think the best thing I can do is find the best experts and see what they've got to say about the relevant science. So that's why I don't think this is a particularly convincing argument. Now, let's move on to arguments based on evidence from the supernatural. Uh, first thing, I, I want to clarify how I'm using some terms. So by naturalism, I just mean, and philosophers tend to mean, the view that everything that exists is natural or physical. That is to say that nothing supernatural exists. Note that you can be an atheist. So if atheism just means the view that there's no God, and agnosticism means the position that we're not sure, both being an atheist and an agnostic is compatible with the non-naturalism. Here's what I mean. You can be an atheist and think that ghosts exist. Or you can be an atheist and you can believe in reincarnation. So there's lots of different ways you can be an atheist or an agnostic and still believe in the supernatural. So we have to pull apart whether or not naturalism is true from whether or not agnosticism or atheism is true. Um, so for reasons of time, I'm not going to assess too deeply whether or not I think there is good evidence for the existence of the supernatural. But I think a good question for us to discuss as we continue this event tonight might be what's the relationship between supernatural things existing and God existing. Here's a position someone could take. Sure, I think there's pretty good evidence for the supernatural, they might say. But why if I then conclude from that that God exists, would, couldn't there be a bunch of other explanations for the supernatural? So maybe that's something we'll talk about more. But without a compelling argument linking the existence of the supernatural to the existence of God specifically, I don't think that argument's very strong either. Um, just brief pause on biblical prophecy. Um, so if it's the case that what looks like fulfilled prophecy in the New Testament is evidence of the supernatural, depends on a certain theory of biblical interpretation. Uh, and I'm not going to pause too long on that for now, but I'm going to sort of flag that as something we could talk about later. Uh, moving to the third argument, this arguments based on a purported sense of the divine. So I'm going to do a little bit of philosophy here uh, from uh, a philosopher, Alvin Plantinga, a Christian philosopher, who argues that we can believe uh, that God exists based on the sense of divine. So I'm going to explain what his argument is and why I think it's not super great. So he talks about properly basic beliefs. Let's start with this idea of a basic belief. To be a basic belief is just a belief you have that's not formed on the basis of another belief. 
So if you believe you're in an auditorium right now, that's a basic belief, probably. Because you believe it because you're seeing things, hearing things, having experiences that suggest you're in an auditorium. I'd also say this is a properly basic argument because you're justified in believing you're in an auditorium right now, I would think. And the reasons why you're justified is because you're having certain sensory experiences as if you were in an auditorium. Those things give you evidence. So Planica wants to make an analogous argument. He says, just as some people have a sense through things like sight or sound or touch uh, that gives them information about the world, some people sense God. It just seems to them that there's a God. They seem to have a sense of God's presence. And he thinks that enough all by itself can justify belief in God, because he thinks that belief in God is what we would call properly basic, and not one of those beliefs you can base just on how things seem to you. Um, I'm not so crazy about this argument, because I think um, that playing this account doesn't provide a way of distinguishing genuine experiences of sensing the divine from misleading ones. We're all aware of some instances where people seem to have an experience of the divine that seems unlikely to actually be the divine. Think about instances where people have done heinous things because they believe the voice of God told them to do so. You probably think in those instances it wasn't really God. Whether or not you think God sometimes reveals his presence, sometimes we can get confused. So the question for Planica then is, how do we distinguish potential genuine sensations of the divine from misleading ones? And I don't see where his account answers that question. And without an answer to that question, I don't think we can just rest on this idea of the sense of the divine as sufficient alone to generate belief in God. This is because I accept a view called evidentialism, and it's a view that Planning rejects. So evidentialism is a view that beliefs are only justified when they're based on sufficient evidence. In my view, Planica doesn't provide us sufficient evidence that senses divinitatis, that's his name for this divine sense, exists or is reliable. Okay, now a little bit on this last argument, moral arguments. So, um, a lot of people think the existence of moral truths is strong evidence that God exists. I do think there are objective moral truths, but I'm not convinced this provides us with strong reason to think that God exists. Is it compatible with God existing? Totally, absolutely. But I also think it's compatible with a world in which God doesn't exist. And I'll try to give you one reason why that we could talk about more. So, Here's a question to ask yourself. Could God have made it morally okay to boil babies? I think we can all agree that it's wrong to boil babies, right? Like put a baby in a boiling water, that would be wrong, that would be morally wrong. So the question is, could God have made it morally right? There are two answers you could give. One is yes, the other is no. If your answer is yes, if you believe God could have made it okay to boil babies, um, the example, by the way, comes from the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. That's who the person is here on the right. She gives this example as, as in the case of an objective moral truth. If you think God could make it morally okay to boil babies, I don't think you and I are talking about the same thing in the when we're talking about morality. All you're talking about is might makes right. I don't think that's really morality at the end of the day. The other answer you could say is no. God couldn't have made that okay. You also would add, and I think you'd be really reasonable in saying that, God never would have done such a thing. I believe you. Because we defined God as an all good being, and that wouldn't be a good thing to do. So God would certainly never do it. But the point is, once you start reasoning this way, it sort of reveals an implicit idea that we have some conception of moral good that is pulled apart from the idea of coming just from divine commands. And if that's right, I don't see what philosophical problem positing God's existence solves and thinking about our objective moral truths. Because it seems like if they don't come specifically from a divine command, they could exist anyway. Now, some people, well, there are, there are responses people can give to this, and maybe we'll talk about them more for later on, but I think that's enough for what I'll say now. Uh, last things, I, few things I want to say, whether or not our existence is the result of pure chance is irrelevant to the fact that we have morally significant properties. So there was a quote earlier that said, why give moral loyalty to pure chance? I would agree, there's no good reason to give moral loyalty to pure chance. But whether or not you are the result of pure chance, the kind of thing you are now is worthy of moral respect. Why? Because we have a bunch of properties that are worthy of moral respect, like the ability to experience pain and pleasure, the ability to laugh, the ability to reason. 
If I understand the kind of being that you are properly, I owe you more respect. Um, and more facts are responsive to these morally significant aspects of our nature, just as logical, mathematical, and physical facts are responsive to other aspects of reality. Um, finally, uh, Dr. Spalding gives this argument from Dredd. He says um, that in order to avoid existential dread, we have a sort of non-evidential reason to make it rationally necessary to believe in God. First thing to note is that this argument is incompatible with what I called evidentialism earlier. And I said I was an evidentialist. So um, he says that belief in God is rationally necessary. But in a sense, he is talking about um, his argument doesn't provide evidence for God's existence. And I think he would admit this. Um, I think maybe we just disagree over evidentialism. He, so um, I don't think, even if his argument's true, it raises the probability that God exists. And that's ultimately what I'm concerned about in my search to try to figure out whether or not I should believe that God exists. What raises the likelihood of the probability? Also, I happen to think both of the premises are false. Um, so he says that the only way to avoid existential dread is to have a certain sort of uh, belief in a God who uh, atones for you, provides mercy and love. What I've found in my life, I have a lot of religious friends. I have a lot of non-religious friends. I have lots of friends who are atheists, agnostics, atheists. I found actually that our existential condition tends to be a lot more similar, despite our beliefs in God. We all face lots of challenges and hardships, whether or not we believe in God or whether we don't. We all can find joy, peace, happiness, and various activities. And it just seems to me that my life experiences don't line up with the premises of these arguments. Um, and if I'm just sharing honestly with you why I end up where I do, I think for me, arguments like these aren't effective because I don't see the evidence of atheists suffering with all this existential dread while the theists are, are just happy all the time, right? And of course, that's a bit of a straw man. But I mean to say, I think on some deep sort of level, the human condition is pretty similar across atheists, theists, and agnostics. And I think that's something valuable to keep in mind. Okay, so this is just a thank you to all the images I used. They were all in the public domain. Uh, and also, as a reminder, my views are my own. Thanks for your time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. We got to call each other by first name at this point because this is this is this is good stuff. Okay. Um, Mark, I join you in your prayer uh, for insight to truth, and, uh, and so, uh, and I and I want I want this evening to be part of that movement toward insight for both of us. So, okay, so what do we do? We we set up these um, the sort of uh, listing of probabilities, and uh, Dr. Sadler did a great job of you know uh, picking at each one and and. Um, uh, working with each one. We talked first of all about the design argument, the anthrop anthropic principle, where he brought up the idea of the multiverse. And I call it multi monkeys uh, because the multiverse uh, is like the old saying if you take a thousand monkeys for a thousand years and you let them bang on a typewriter, on uh, typewriters, that eventually they'll come up with a poem or something. Uh, the multiverse solution is essentially the same thing. We show up here, and actually there's a, there's a, there's a the fallacy that's involved called the inverse gambler's fallacy, where I show up here and, 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 uh, and I think this is the universe. And the reason I say that is because I'm here, and the fallacy is uh, that, that I don't know what happened uh, before me, and, uh, and so I assume, in the multiverse, I assume that that the, all these other universes came along and they screwed up everything until they finally got it right. And the universe that finally got it right, or the monkeys that finally got it right, are the ones we have now. Um, so I, I'm not as willing to move that uh, to a, a lesser uh, status, perhaps, as, as they might otherwise be. Similarly, the, um, the design argument uh, uh, using irreducible complexity is kind of a straw man because I didn't say the words irreducible complexity and I didn't promote them. And it wasn't Stephen Meyer who was associated with 
uh, with uh, irreducible co complexity is Michael Behe and Josh Joshua Swamidas. Michael Behe has a PhD in, in biochemistry from the University of Pennsylvania. Joshua Swamidas is an associate professor at Washington University of St. Louis. Both of them obviously not Christian schools as such. Uh, my point is that we can get caught up in a credentials fallacy. Yeah. And, and so uh, even when we talk about experts having uh, 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 epistemic authority. You know what else experts have epistemic authority? Lots of experts have, epi have epistemic authority over geocentrism, species saltation, ambiogenesis, eugenics, racist theories, and any number of other things that over the years scientific consensus has been proven to be not only wrong, but morally wrong. And, uh, and he talked about Dr. Falk. Um, actually, there's an interesting piece in Evolution at News and Science Today critiquing false crit critique. And he points out that much of what Falk did was he criticized um, uh, he, uh, Stephen Meyer's older books and ignored the fact that his most recent books that actually answered some of the questions that Dr. Falk uh, wanted to raise. And so again, I don't, I don't know if it's only helpful to play credential games uh, and, and try to work on what is really true about the universe based on that. Uh, uh, the, the last thing I'll point out is, uh, uh, is uh, and I, I just kind of do this, uh, evidentialism, uh, if I want to base my my ideas of, of what I accept to be true on uh, evidentialism, I say to you, what evidence have you got for that system? Because that is not based on evidentialism, that's based on a uh, concept. Um, I was a little uh, upset about hearing about boiling babies. Uh, it did remind me of a passage in First Kings 6 uh, where a baby was boiled. And of course, it was anathema to God and a, and a, and a, and a symbol of the amount of idolatry that had been uh, built, come into the culture uh, of the time. So I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the, for the insights that, that uh, Dr. Santa brought. Um, I, I don't believe that the insights were carried that much weight, though, because of some of the fallacies that they carried with them. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I guess I would, I would. Uh, how much time have I got? Um, five and a half minutes. That's perfect. Uh, I, Dr. Sandler knows a little bit about Richard, Richard Swinburne. He actually helped put together a conference on Richard Swinburne and put together a, a, an anthology of papers from that conference. Uh, I like this quote from Richard Swinburne. I suggest that if the probability, the probability of the existence of God is on someone's evidence is not too low after adequate investigation, it would indeed be a best act to worship and repent before God. I, I think that makes pretty good sense. I think that if, if I look back at my uh, listing, uh, a lot of those are not too low, uh, and, uh, and and they speak to uh, something else. So, uh, our, a lot of what I'm I'm focused on is is uh, thinking about. How is there hope in all of this? We're talking about all of this. How is there hope? We're talking about good arguments for belief in God. And we know that people put brick walls in front of those arguments. Why don't well, they have the reasons? They don't want to be under God's authority. They want to live their life. They want to have their freedom. They want to have rely on their rationality, their desires, their nervings, for crying out loud. And, uh, and so people will put walls in front, uh, in front of it. What that does is it blocks them from uh, any, any notion of, of reaching out to God and seeking and wrestling with God. Uh, and no matter what happens, some people will put that block up. No matter how good the arguments are, people will block those things. Uh, so this is exactly what the Bible tells us. He says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Ever, it's not, it's, there's no cloud. It's clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And we read elsewhere, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, and that includes demons and celestial beings and other supernatural creatures. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in, in him all things hold together. So at the end of the day, yep, there is some angst, 
there is some dread. I'm not going to, I don't want to rely too much on the sampling error of, of circles of friends and relatives and all of that. But the fear of the Lord is uh, itself is a good thing. That's why my book is called The Gift of Dread. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So people can put those blocks up. I believe we've made good arguments to take those, that, those blocks down. But people will still put the wall up because they don't want to submit themselves to God, to Jesus. And why is that? Again, the Bible tells us they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So our idea here as rational Christie and, as, and as, as a way of thinking through these things through the lens of the Bible, we can talk about good arguments for God and uh, we can talk about belief in God, uh, but the, but the real thing we want to be mindful is of the larger we are, the larger idea of God that we have, the more fearsome, awesome that idea of God gets, and the more we realize we need a savior, and that's where Jesus Christ comes in, and there is salvation by no other name. Thank you. So I'll try to work through as many of those points as I can in roughly a 10 minute um, period. Good luck to me. Um, so I'll start with this thing. Uh, Dr. Spaulding suggests that I used a bit of a straw man because I used the words irreducible complexity. I don't think that makes it a straw man because I gave it that label. If that's in fact an accurate label of what the argument is, it doesn't matter whether or not he used those particular words. It's interesting, he credits a number of other people who have explicitly used the phrase irreducible complexity. Um, and the thing is, people like Michael Behe and Stephen Meyer, they work for the same institution. They work for the Discovery Institute. They work on these books together. They're co-laborers in a common cause. So to use words that someone like Michael Beasley has used and say like, well, that's not Stephen Myers, I don't think that's completely forthright, or maybe it just doesn't understand the relationships between these figures who are doing work. So I don't think it's a straw man. Um, and then um, moving on to this idea of credential games. I'm gonna pause here, because I can see why it would seem like I'm just trying to appeal to authorities, right? People who have fancy degrees in science. But that's not what I'm trying to do. If anything, I'm trying to actually share with you my own method of how I try to form beliefs. I try to be what's called intellectually humble, meaning that I think I don't know everything. The world is just way too complicated for me to know it all. And what I have to do is outsource some of that work to other people who have expertise and training in relevant areas. So I think that works as a pretty good principle for me. It works when I go to the doctor, the dentist, plumber, auto mechanic, etc. And I try to do the same thing with technical areas in science. And it's just the case that the overwhelming majority of scientists don't think the fine-tuning and irreducible complexity arguments work. Why outsource them here? Because some of the premises, some of the steps in the argument are claims about our best science. So I don't defer to them about everything, but I do defer to them specifically on those claims. And it's not just trying to play a credentials game. It's trying to use the best tools I actually have at trying to come to the truth. And that means sometimes I'll defer to experts. Um, Burke suggests that evidentialism is a theory that I have no evidence for because it's a concept. I don't think that's right. The reason I'm an evidentialist is because everything about my life's experience suggests it's a pretty sensible mode of doing things. Generally, if I form beliefs on the basis of evidence, those beliefs are more likely to be ones that are confirmed later on. If I believe there's a podium in front of me, I'm less likely to hit the podium by walking right into it, right? We have to form beliefs all the time, and we form it based on our evidence. Lots of things come as evidence. Our memories, our perceptions, testimony, things we learn from other people. And the reason I stick as an evidentialist is because that theory is continually confirmed every time I successfully manage to operate in the world based on beliefs I've come to accept based on the evidence. 
If try the other method. Try forming beliefs that aren't based on your evidence. See how well things go for you. It doesn't work very well. Um, so um, the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of putting up walls. So Burke starts to give some theories as to why he thinks some people don't believe in God. And he was being, in a way, a good evidentialist, because he's suggesting the reasons that people don't believe in God are not because they don't have good evidence, but for other reasons, like they don't want to be held accountable for their sins, or they don't want to have to submit to somebody else. Now, that's a theory. And it's a theory we could test by seeing whether or not the evidence supports it. One way you could test it is go out and find the people in the world that don't believe in God and look at their behaviors. Do they seem to not believe in God because they just don't want to listen to any higher authority? They want to be able to live life the way that they want and callous hedonism now and not worry about the future later? Maybe there are some atheists out there like it. But as someone who's tried to get to know a lot of people, that just doesn't ring true to me about a lot of atheists. I just don't. Nothing in my lived experience suggests that most people deny God just because they don't like the idea of God existing. Um, Bert suggests this is a sampling error because I'm just talking about the people I know. I have actually given you a sample, though, which is more than we've gotten on the other side. Bert's put forward a number of theories about why atheists are subject to a certain kind of existential dread or why certain people don't believe in God. But with a sample sizing of zero to back it up, maybe he will give us some examples later. But notice that, too, he's also relying on a sample. It's really hard not to rely on samples in practical life. We can't do general population-level searches of everything. So, you know, if you're someone right now who actually believes all atheists are atheists because they just don't like the idea of believing in God, I'd suggest trying to befriend them. Ask them. Try to get to know them, hear their reasons. Invest in their lives and see if that still rings true. Maybe you'll find that it will, but maybe you won't. I certainly haven't. And I can't tell you what your own experience is going to be like in your own relationships. But I'm skeptical that everyone who doesn't believe in God, it's just because they're putting up walls for something they don't want to believe. I know a lot of people who have uh, deconstructed or deconverted from the Christian faith or other faiths. Many people who do this find it an extremely painful experience because they love their Christian faith. But for one reason or another, they feel they can't stick with it. Some it's because they think the evidence doesn't continue to support their beliefs. Um, for others, it's because of ways in which uh, they feel as if the Christian faith isn't living up to, to what it's supposed to be. They feel it's not bearing the good fruit it's supposed to. I'll also make a brief pause here. We're talking a lot about Christianity, which makes sense. We're here with a Christian student group today. But I don't presume everyone in this room who believes in God is here because they're a Christian. And I want to uh, sort of respectfully acknowledge that you're welcome in this space too. Uh, Muslim, Hindu, any other faith tradition that might be here this evening. Um, so I, I, think, I think I'll stop there for now because thankfully we have a few more back and forth to go. And then a chance to hear from you all. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> the most important part. So I'm actually not going to treat this like uh, a cross-examination. I am going to treat it like a, although that's, that's a fine term. But the lawyers up here, you might think that's, that's a particularly welcome term, and sometimes it is. Uh, but I think what I want to do is try to uh, establish some, some common ground and further understanding. So the goal isn't to try to like, gotcha. 
Um, it's just to try to see if we can get a little more information about some relevant stuff. Um, and so I think actually the first thing I want to pick up on this idea is when you're talking about different reasons why uh, people might not believe in God. I don't mean to say that there aren't people in the world who, who don't believe in God for those reasons. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that that's, that captures all the reasons why people don't believe in God. It seems like it's much more complicated than that. So I guess I'm going to start with just an invitation for you to say a bit more about, I, there's two ways it could go. One could be you trying to argue more that all people that don't believe in God don't believe in God for the sorts of reasons you gave. Or it is also an opportunity just to expand on your account of maybe the different reasons why you think people fail to believe in God. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so I, I, have to, I have to answer you by looking through the lens, the worldview that is offered to me by the Bible. And in the Bible, uh, we, we have this idea of the fall. We have creation. We've talked a little bit about the amazing uh, fine-tuning of creation. We have creation, but we have the fall. And in, 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 the, in, the, in the Judeo Christian tradition, uh, Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God uh, and they, they became disenfranchised and uh, they were at enmity with God and we inherit that in, enmity. So the natural, the natural position of a person um, before God is to hate God. And then we have redemption, and redemption is through Jesus Christ. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled with God. So uh, I don't expect people, uh, you know, if, if a person is uh, not a follower of Christ, I have no expectations as far as up, down, morally, lifestyle, social justice issues, whatever. I, it's, it's, it's whatever goes is, is what it is um, but when a person hears the gospel which I presented tonight hears the gospel and responds to that gospel by saying you know what I just need to get I just need to get things right with God I just got I get this thing sorted out and when that happens um, they they enter into a new relationship with God and that changes everything it is it is really it is truly is reflected throughout history in the in the charity works that have been done even from the first century, uh, the hospitals, the, uh, the, the, the giving programs, uh, efforts to abolish slavery, uh, so many things that, have, that Christians have contributed uh, selflessly. And it also is reflected, Mark, in, uh, in just general demeanor, just a general sense. Yes, we could talk about sampling and so on, but uh, there's, a, there's a researcher named Vanderweel, Thomas, I believe his first name, Tyler. Tyler Vanderweel has done some studies and there have been longitudinal studies uh, that have followed his studies that have, have uh, confirmed that, that folks who, who, who follow Christ, who go to church on a regular basis, they have longer mortality, less depression. I mean, this is sci scientifically, uh, it's been shown longitudinally over, over years involving a sample of tens of thousands of people. So, so there, there is a difference in, 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 in being a follower of Christ and not being a follower of Christ. You're absolutely right. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. In fact, sometimes I'm so embarrassed by my Christian brother or sister, I, I don't even want to be seen in the same room with them, let alone in the same church or whatever. Uh, but but at, at the end of the day, being reconciled with God is, is a far better circumstance to find oneself in than to be not reconciled. So uh, I guess a, a quick comment, and then I, I think I am going to do a bit of a kind of direct uh, a, cr a cross-examination move, which is to say, you didn't really answer the question. I'm going to make you say a little more. Uh, so the comment first, if I understand your answer right, it's largely based on accepting a big biblical worldview and then thinking about what that entails for how people behave based on that worldview. Um, so I'm someone who uh, grew up in an evangelical church, and I later got confirmed in the Episcop Episcopal Church. I'm an, uh, a sort of agnostic Episcopalian. Uh, so this is two rather different parts of Christianity. And the point I want to make here is that Christians are not a monolith in how they read scripture. 
They're not even a monolith in how they think about what the sources of spiritual authority are. Certain Protestant denominations tend to uh, view biblical inerrancy and biblical literalism as really important for getting Christian truths right. The uh, Episcopal parish I got confirmed in had a pretty different view. It was a much more pluralistic view of where religious authority comes from. It's going to come from the Bible, but it's also going to come from things like experience, reason, and tradition. So um, something we can continue to talk about either now or in the Q&A is substantively how to think about what the Christian message is. Because I think it's not fair to take it for granted that there's one obvious answer to how that works. Okay, but the way I'm going to push back, like you ended up talking more about um, the goodness of Christians than you did about the condition of non-believers. The question is, um, aside from adopting a particular conception of how to read certain scripture texts, do you have any good reason to think that most people who are non-believers are non-believers for the wall-raising reasons you put up and not for other legitimate reasons, like they're following the evidence and it just doesn't seem clear to them that God exists? Well, I, I showed you a few Bible verses that talked about how they are blind. They are blinded by their ignorance of and their, their lack of relationship with God. So uh, the wall is not, the, the, the brick wall that I showed is not because of this particular reason, this reason. It's, any and all reasons that, that people reject, uh, but, but it's purposeful, it's intentional. You can't hear the message of Jesus Christ, you can't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and, and, and have it presented to you and say, look, this is, uh, this is how God set it up so that you could find your way back to God through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, it, if you hear that message and you reject it, then there's a brick wall for whatever reason you reject it. You just rejected it. That's it. Okay, it seems to me that the, the narrative is changing a little bit. The brick wall is a little sparser than it was before. But I, I, how much time do we have left in this sort of first back and forth? Three minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what happens when people leave the Christian faith. Because this happens a lot. It's actually happening a lot um, in the United States right now, particularly in people that are in the millennial generation, which I fall into. Lots of people have had a story like mine where they started somewhere in Christianity and they've either left completely or they've moved to a very different part of it. What do you think is going on here? I'm glad you asked that question. I actually uh, have a podcast called Transition to Hope, which is, which is focused on folks who are leaving or who have left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the statistics are showing that as they leave the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that most become atheists or agnostics. And they, and the process, they are experiencing a, a crisis in faith. And what, what, we, what we found with that, and I'm quite involved with, with, with the community of, of people who are involved with ex-Mormons, ex-LDS, is that because the scripture was warped, the scripture was, the, the, they were, it, was, it was taught that the Bible was less than the Book of Mormon and so on. In other words, there were some problems with the teachings. Then people have to sort of, they, they, they throw the baby out of the bathwater. They, they just become atheists or agnostics. He's, I'm out of here. You know, the way some people have done in any, any number of faith traditions, not just Mormons. Um, so then they have to reconstruct. Their, their, their idea about God. And, and, and th there's just there's two things that, 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 that I can offer to that person. The Bible, but besides prayer, the Bible and a healthy church. And the, yeah, there's a whole lot of different kinds of churches, but there is such a thing as a healthy church. And a healthy church is one that, that, uh, that, that has love, that has a love for God, a love for the Bible, a love for truth, a love for each other, and a love for the journey that we're all on together. And, and, uh, and, and that's when, when I see these statistics about, you know, uh, better health and better well-being of, of church attenders that, that Tyler Vanderweel and his cohorts have come up with, uh, it, it begins to make more and more sense to me because I, I can see what that kind of an experience in a healthy church and a, and a focus on biblical truth and not all of the different ways that people can build on that, but just look straight at the Bible and see what it has to say. That is, that is a very rewarding and it's a real blessing to, to, to focus on that, on a healthy church and the Bible. Do we have time for one more or are we out? 
We're out, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay, we'll switch it up. Let's just keep it going. Uh, nah, I want to hear from them in a bit, so, okay. and, and from you. Well, I was going to, on my dime, yeah. I was going to do it on my, on my 10 minutes, so, all right. So, Mark, is there evidence for the existence of God? Hmm. So, it's a good question. I want to say almost none. Uh, so I think if we're thinking about your chart, mm -hmm. I would put some of the categories into the some evidence. Mm -hmm. So for example, I think the fine tuning is some evidence for God's existence. Mm -hmm. I think the reason I only put it in the some evidence category is because there are a variety of other explanations that would explain that data. But here's how I think about evidence. A is evidence for B if A raises the probability of B being true. I think the fact that there are so many finely tailored parameters to the universe um, does increase the probability of God's existence. Okay. So yes, it meets the sum evidence category. I'm trying to think if there are other ones that I would say fall into the sum evidence category. Um, I'm not convinced that there aren't any others. I tend to think that's the, the best of the lot. Um, one other question to consider though, which we haven't tonight, because our question was just how good are the arguments for God's existence, but how good are the arguments against God's existence? I don't think those are particularly strong either. I don't think there's a knockdown case proving that God doesn't exist. But just as I think fine tuning does provide some evidence in favor of the view that God exists, I think the kind of evil that we see in the world, some people can reasonably conclude that that provides some evidence that God doesn't. So for people who look around at the great suffering in this world and say, why would God have made a world like this? It seems to me that it's less likely that God exists given all the types of, of suffering and evil that exists in the world. I think that's kind of counterbalancing evidence against. Once again, I don't think it's conclusive, not by a long shot. I think a lot of careful theists have come up with good arguments that prevent that evidence from being definitive. So yes, I do think there's some evidence and I think it kind of washes out against the evidence against. All right, well, I am gonna, avoid going after the bait of the problem of evil, which mm. <laughs> because that's not on our list of, of arguments. So you brought it up and I won't, I won't bite. So may I talk about Swinburne just for a bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. In his, because I know you're familiar with Swinburne, very, probably a lot more than I am. But he talks about the principle of credulity. Uh, and I'm gonna read uh, his statement, experiences and reports of experience experiences and reports of experience are trustworthy if their content is not highly improbable for other reasons. Are you okay with that? Can you give it, so Swinburne states the principle different ways at different times. So I wanna hear the, the okay, one Okay, this is the one, one I have. Time. Experience and reports of experience are trustworthy if their content is not highly improbable for other reasons. So, uh, good, good, thank you for bringing this up. So first of all, I actually do wanna change my, my previous answer. Um, if we're talking about things that reach the sum evidence bar, I actually think people who have a sense that God exists or who have experiences of the divine, that also is some evidence. And what's interesting about that is something like the fine tuning argument, that's something we all get to share. We get to look at the premises together and we get to think about how good it is. Something like individual experiences or just a strong sense that God exists, that's not shareable in the same sort of way. So I actually think the evidence that different people have for God's existence can differ depending on their own experiences. Um, but to come back around to this, I would buy that version of the... I'm going to ask you to read it for me one more time with that to, bit I, here, in, you know what? in place. I'll just hand it to you. Okay. So, uh, where, where is it on this? Oh uh, uh, yeah, it's the highlight part. Yeah. Okay. So ex experiences and reports of experiences are trustworthy if their content is not highly improbable for other reasons. So here's, I think, what Swinburne's going for. The idea is if something seems to you to be the case, you sort of have a default entitlement to believe it. Think about, once again, the belief that you're in this auditorium. Uh, it seems to you, if you look around, if you touch the seat, you've got lots of sort of like sensory evidence that you're in an auditorium. So you're justified in believing that. Um, so that would be an experience. So when he talks about experiences and reports of experiences, the idea is generally your experiences are trustworthy. But of course we're not perfectly reliable agents, right? 
sometimes we have experiences that we're wrong about. Remember, uh, think about sometimes you're talking with someone from your childhood, and it turns out you just remember an event very differently. You can't both be right. Our memories are fallible, our experiences are fallible. Um, philosophers have talked a lot about different ways in which our sensations can go wrong. But what Swinburne's saying is by default, we sort of get to trust how things seem to us um, unless the, the seeming is highly implausible. So if it seemed to me that all of a sudden a unicorn popped up right in front of me, my, my belief might be not, oh, I believe there's a unicorn here. My belief might be, something's gone wrong with my perceptuary system. I, I think it's unlikely that a unicorn just popped in front of me. So that's the idea that it would be highly improbable. But here's what I want to add. What Swinburne's giving here is a principle of default belief, not his all things considered view about when something is justified. Because if you think that this is his full account, the only way a belief could become unjustified is if it's made highly improbable for right. other reasons. Right. I don't actually think that's what he's quite saying or else it would be really hard to dislodge um, our default beliefs. So if that is what he's flat-footedly saying, I actually reject this principle because it makes it too hard to disconfirm our experiences yeah. by evidence. But if he's just saying by default, you're entitled to believe things are how they seem to you unless you've got good reason otherwise, I can get on board with that. So if, for example, you're someone who it just seems to you that God exists, you're justified unless you've got good reasons to think otherwise. And this actually does go back to things like the problem of evil. Um, I, I think my view is most of us do have enough counter evidence that we shouldn't just rely on how things seem to us. The world's really complicated. Um, things like the existence of the problem of evil. The, also the fact that different people in the world have different beliefs. In philosophy, we talk about sometimes what's called the epistemology of disagreement. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to do big phrases. Here I am. But it's the basic idea that you have to figure out or take account for the fact that other people disagree with you. So if we're thinking about things that can sort of dislodge our default um, experiences of how things seem to be as reasons to believe. Um, so let's say you're someone who finds it to be the case that you just think God exists. Something that should make you a little cautious is the number of people in the world that think otherwise, or do think God exists, but they have a very different conception of God than you do. Why do your seemings get to win out over theirs? Um, so I think for me, I, I tend to be what's called a conciliationist, which means I think we should take really seriously when other people disagree with us. So generally, people don't disagree with our um, reports of, yeah, if you, you said, I believe I'm in an auditorium right now, everyone else is going to agree with you about that. There's not that sub sort of substantive disagreement. It's not so with the case of belief in God. We're done? No. <coughs> uh, two minutes. Okay, so let's continue with that. In fact, I'll give you this back because I've got it on my computer over here. So oh, I have to keep reading over and over. So number two, so, so let's go back to number one. I, I don't think, uh, because it says highly improbable, I don't think one is a huge barrier. I mean, it's... Uh, in other words, it, it, it's very accommodating. Experiences are trustworthy if their content is not highly improbable for other reasons. So there's a, a, a willingness to, if you will, grant some benefit of the doubt. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll roll with it just for time's sake. I want to hear whatever your next Okay, well, I wanted to go lie. to number two. Some religious believers make and or report religious experiences which, if veridical or if true, would imply the existence of God. I mean, that's... that's yeah, yeah. Well, that's Happy to accept that premise. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, hence, reports of religious experience are trustworthy if God's existence is not highly improbable for other reasons. In other words, he's building back number one. Yeah, and this goes back to, I think it really depends on how we unpack what number one means. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I, I buy number one as written, unless we're just interpreting it as sort of like uh, some, yeah, I, I think it's the highly improbable. Mm -hmm. I think our default beliefs can get dislodged more easily than just high improbability. Okay, all right. Uh, how are we doing? I, I think, let's just stop there as far as, yeah, because we, we want to have time for questions. Okay. So, all right, is that okay with you? Sure, okay. sure, yeah, yeah. I want to confer with you first. Yeah, good idea. Okay, at this time, we're gonna go to Q&A. And there's different ways to do Q&A. 
way we're going to do it is you raise your hand and I will call on you. Stand here. Good. What? <laughs> yes, sir. You're first. Question for Bert. Uh, what is required for a mind, for a man or a woman or boy or girl to find peace with God? So the Bible, I'm going to have to give you the biblical answer because that's the one that that's the that's the that's the glasses I those are the eyeglasses I look through. Uh, would you repeat the question though? I'm sorry. What is required for a person to find peace with God? Okay, so this is not an easy question to answer in the sense that um, to become a follower of Christ, which is what is required to become a follower of Christ, it's not just accepting some truth claims that Jesus existed as as a human walked on the earth, that he is also God, truth claim that he is God, which the Bible tells us the demons believe that, um, that he lived a perfect life, that he actually died. He didn't, it wasn't a fake death. He actually died uh, and was buried and rose from the dead. That, uh, that if we believe in those things, that's, that's the, the foundation. However, there's another word that gets in the way. It's called repent. And the word repent doesn't mean what a lot of people think, like a sandwich board, repent, you know, or you're going to hell. Repent really just simply means turning away from whatever my idols were in my life, whatever things that took my, formed my identity, uh, drew me out into all my way of living and, and uh, purposefulness. I'm going to turn from that and just focus on Christ. Just focus on Christ. And, and what's that going to mean in my life? I don't know. Everybody's different. If you got, we're all sinners. If you've got a list of sins, and you've got all different kinds of sins, I have no idea how the Holy Spirit's going to start with this one or this one or this one over here or this one over here and help you work through and develop a closer relationship. I don't know. But I do know it takes a turning away from our previous life toward Christ. So, Jim? Yeah, actually, I do have some thoughts on this. Um, so, uh, you talked about the uh, biblical answer here, uh, and I'm going to sort of like harp on this line every time like someone takes a particular conception about how to think about how to interpret the Bible. Um, I think part of what makes uh, me a searcher, someone who's trying to figure it out rather than someone who's decided on a particular uh, outcome, is how I view what the Bible says it is. Uh, you seem to view the Bible as a book that takes itself as the kind of book that provides clear answers to these important existential questions. I'm not so yeah, I don't. sure that that's what the Bible... I'm shaking my head, but keep going. Yeah, I'm not... Oh, right, right, so maybe I've misunderstood your yeah. view of, what, of how yeah. the Bible works, and then you yeah. can correct me. Yeah. Um, but, so here's what I think. I don't see any place where the Bible tells us it's going to give us clear answers. I don't see any place where the Bible tells us it's without error, or that it needs to be interpreted literally. If you're someone who grew up in church, you're probably thinking of 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. <laughs> All uh, scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, etc. Um, I, I feel like once I was trying to pass it off as if I could just not say anything about this, but I remember them all. Um, but let's stop and think about this. It says only scripture. But this isn't one of Paul's letters. Paul's letters were the first part of the New Testament written. The rest of the New Testament hasn't even been written yet. And it's not going to be until about 200 CD that we get a clear sense of what the New Testament canon is. In what sense do we think all these scriptures were from the New Testament? That seems like a bizarre to me. It seems a bit arrogant on the part of Paul. Actually, but, uh, we can talk about what that Well, can I help you with that, just one? Yeah, 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 sure. So Second Peter, and I don't have the exact verse, but Second Peter refers to Paul's writings as Scripture. So there is, there is a credentializing, if you will, that takes place. But the other thing is, you know, clear answers. That's why we have the church. That's why we have each other. Because we're all in this together. We worship together. We pray together. We are accountable to each other. We, 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 we point out sin where there's sin needs to be pointed out. We, point, we, we bring comfort as we need to uh, in the church. And along the way, uh, we can look back and say, oh, you know what? My path was clearer than I thought it was just at the outset. So, you know, I, I don't know what 
you know, brand of this computer is dying. I don't know what brand of computer I'm going to buy because it tells me in the Bible. It certainly doesn't. You know. Yeah, I, I, I'm a philosopher. Of course, I could say more, but I'm going to shut myself up so we can hear some more yeah, questions. Yeah, let's get another question. Okay. Moderator. <laughs> Well, you were next, so we'll go with you. But the chart winner, everybody. Yeah, yeah. My name's Bob, and you seem to be not a believer in this Bible, but I have a lot of people here that totally believe this to be true. And people smarter than all of the people in this universe, from the beginning of time in the first Bible written, they've been trying to diss this thing and disprove it, and they haven't been able to. And while this is not a word-for-word -word history book accurate, most of the prophecies have been proven to come true. And what's the your existence question? of Christ. What's your question? Oh, do you believe this is true. Jesus lived. It's, it, he, you know, that's a fact. You can't disprove that. Thank you. That's the question. So, I do believe that Jesus lived. And I think the, the Gospels and, and a lot of the New Testament writings are pretty good evidence of that. Um, I think it, it gets a little tricky when uh, you talk about whether or not I believe that the book is true. I think it says lots of true things, and I think it has lots of truth. But I do deny the doctrine of biblical inerrancy, and I deny the doctrines of biblical literalism. Part of why I think that, for example, is I think the Bible has, uh, and I don't mean this, it, um, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but my own best reading of the Bible is that it has internal inconsistencies. Take the resurrection stories across the four Gospels. I read them carefully, and I think they can't all four be literally true at once. So I think if God exists and did give us this book, he did give us it out of the book that was supposed to be understood as literally true. And that's kind of scary, right? Because it was, um, I, I think my gut instinct is to think that a loving God would make the answers really clear. That's how my personality works. I don't like uncertainty. Um, and so my instinct is to think like, yeah, wouldn't God give us a book that was really, really clear? But spending time with the book, I actually think a lot of it's not unclear, or a lot of it is unclear. And um, it can still be a valuable book, but I don't just read it flat-footedly and saying all true things. I don't, I don't think that could be possible when it has internal inconsistencies. So that's my view. And I think on um, lots of Christians during history, whether or not you classify me as a Christian or not, I'm not super concerned with that. But talking about like the Christian faith, lots of people who, for whom it was very important to them that they were identified as Christians, would have a view that's pretty similar to mine. Nope. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Dr. Bruce Russell here, and I, I want you to know that the last time Dr. Bruce Spalding did a debate like this, it was with Dr. Russell. He would have been standing right there in that podium there, and they, it was, I think two, you did two. No, one. Oh, only one. Okay. Anyway, that was very interesting. So, you have a question. I do have a question. Let's see whether I slipped into similarity since that earlier <laughs> uh, So my questions are about fine tuning and actual, I don't know what Mark called the uh, irreducible complexity or it has to do with the DNA argument, because those three are two strongest reasons. So here's what I have to say about fine tuning. Um, for one thing, I think you misunderstand the alternative hypothesis, the multiverse hypothesis, because it's not as if it was something produced like it would be with a bunch of monkeys typing, you know, and finally getting Shakespeare's works. It, it's, uh, one version of it is they exist right now, all of them. It's not as if they came into existence sequentially. Are you asking me about that? Or are you... Uh, I haven't finished, but okay. I will. That's one of the parts. Okay. So you misunderstand, I think, the multiverse and the criticism of the view you gave isn't applicable to the one that I'm saying is the best version of the multiverse. The second thing I have to say about fine tuning is, you have to ask what's the probability given the total evidence. So maybe I just grant you that it's likely that if God exists, 
there would be a universe like ours that supports life and intelligent life and so forth. If God exists, it's likely. Uh, and it's not so likely if God doesn't exist. But the total evidence in, isn't just the uh, unlikelihood of the universe. It's how likely is it, given that, and that if, if there's very little life, apparently, in the universe, you think God would make the universe with more life? And why is there that dark contour path through evolution to get to the kind of life that God really wants, maybe the kind of life that we show? And finally, what about all the evil? What's the likelihood on the total evidence that if there's a God, there would be this? Okay, so Dr. Dr. Russell has asked me five questions, all of which take about a half an hour to, to answer. I'm only going to answer one. And the one I'd like to answer is uh, just about the multiverse. And it's a question. What evidence is there of a multiverse? And the answer is zero. Next question. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, well, yeah. Don't you have your own mic down there? Oh, I don't, I don't need your mic. I'm not, I'm not asking for your mic. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I did give Dr. Russell preferential treatment. I know because he was the former creator. And uh, yes, um, but nobody else gets that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so I was very curious. Um, this question pertains to uh, Professor Scott. Could, could you give um, a mic? We can do that. That's a good idea. Or, or, or if people could come and stand over there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can. But it can probably reach. Let's the, see what we can do here. It can probably reach. The, oh, I didn't even see that. Okay, well, you're in charge of Okay, sorry about that. Um, so my question is towards um, Professor Spaulding. I do notice that throughout your, um, you know, debate, you do utilize um, the Bible as a means of trying to really strengthen your argument concerning whether any of the arguments um, are good for trying to argue whether God is real or not. I am very curious about why that might be the case, concerning the fact that there are so many different versions of the Bible. I'm not sure which version of the Bible you're personally using, but concerning the fact that there's so many different versions and there are so many theologists and experts that have like their own interpretations of the Bible, why do you think that is a good way of trying to strengthen your argument. Thank you very much for your question. I really appreciate it. Um, let's talk about versions of the Bible. Uh, in the original languages, there's one version of the Bible. And so when you look at the Old Testament, uh, the most recent manuscripts that we had until recently uh, came to, uh, were about the, about the year 900 AD. Uh, but when the Dead Sea Scrolls showed up, we can now look at two, uh, two, uh, 200 BC and see the exact same documents, the exact same uh, books in with uh, about a I think it was a 95.9 uh, variance, which is mostly typographical and so on. So we have a good Hebrew Bible. Uh, we also have a good uh, New Testament. Um, there, yes, there are dozens of different versions of the New Testament. All of them, though, have one thing in common, and that they are an effort to provide the most true and reliable and helpful and accurate translation of the Greek that we can have into English. And there are different linguists, and, and actually Dr. Sad is a, li a linguist, and he knows about some of these things. But there are different uh, ways to interpret a Greek phrase based on pu lack of punctua punctuation and everything else. So we really do have, uh, and the other thing is some versions of, of, of the Bible are, are more narrative. Uh, they give like the bigger pictures as you go along. Some are really very literal and clumsy and, 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 and club-footed because they try to take every Greek word and turn it into an English word and it just gets weird. Uh, so, uh, so I, I, I am, but, but I think the, the better question, and this actually relates to something that Mark was talking about, is not so much that, that, that the Bible provides clear answers for this or that or this, uh, but that the Bible is reliable. 
And so there it is. It's reliable. I have good English. I have good English translations, which are a, a, a good faith effort to translate the Greek, and then, and then of course uh, the Hebrew and the Chaldean as well. Uh, but I have, I have it. Uh, there it is. And honestly, I apologize if it if it looked like I was trying to strengthen my arguments. I really apologize for that because that was not. That's not my intent. My intent is to rely upon the Bible and to gain an understanding from the Bible to some uh, a sense of God's spirit, a sense of God's talking, God's speaking, His word, His inspiration. I want to learn from the Bible. And when I, when I offer a Bible verse, all I'm saying is, man, this is what it looks like over here. And sure enough, look at what the Bible has to say about it. And, and yeah, I guess in a sense it does strengthen, but, but I don't mean it to like a hammer or a clobber. I mean it like um, th this, this is telling me something really important. And I hope that it says something valuable to you as well. And that's, that's my intent. Okay, you're next. Well, science tells us that only light comes from light. And there's a law of entropy. Things go from more complex to less complex. Those aren't scientific theories. They're scientific laws. Well, evolution flies in the face of that. They're saying that light came from non-light, yet there is no scientific evidence. I mean, even trying to do it with using our brains, they have never been able to come up with creating light. They can take living matter like a, uh, an egg cell, an egg, and add something to it to make light, but they cannot make light from chemicals, materials, and so forth. So how do we come up? We keep coming up with evolution when the very basis is unscientific. Who's your question for? Yeah. Him. <laughs> Dr. Mark Sata. Give us time. <laughs> That, that's what they keep, but guess what? We're only able to have so many years, and then we go to the dust, just like you said. From yes. dust to cane to dust to dust. What's your question for Dr. Okay. Santa? That's, I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah. You get it, right? I think I do. Yeah. yeah. What I would say with the first one is I'm, I'm not. I don't, only comes from life. Yeah, I don't think that's a scientific principle. I just disagree with you about that. <laughs> um, so the second one about entropy, um, I think that you have to think about that as sort of like localized in application. If you're thinking about the Big Bang theory, um, but the way the universe developed, it wasn't always moving in the direction of chaos and disorder further away from another. You have to think in a longer trip, actually. So I don't think either of these things uh, uh, make evolution as a theory on scientific. No, sorry. I'm sorry. Next. All right. You really mean like that. Okay. This young man up front. All right. My question is directed to uh, Mark. Uh, you're very critical of uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Balding and uh, that, uh, that Mr. Doctor. <laughs> you're very critical of uh, him and the people that he proposed as experts when he came to the um, uh, uh, fine-tuning arguments, and you said that uh, there are certain experts that you're more inclined to lean towards. My question is, how do you choose your experts? What is your hierarchy, and do you? Uh, have a, a bias potentially to those things and why? Because if, you know, be he and these other scientists do have PhDs, they've done their work and they've done their due diligence and they've come to a different conclusion, why favor one PhD over another? Is there a reason for that? Yeah, so there are reasons for it. It's a good question. Um, so on, on the latter point, like, yeah, I assume I have biases in the way that everybody has biases. Um, I don't think they're playing some sort of uh, untoward role, though, in my like principles for expert selection. Here's two things you can use to try to decide which experts to go with. This is actually uh, a question that philosophers have been really concerned with lately. What do you do when the experts disagree with each other? Because earlier I said there's this basic idea, you want to defer when you're dealing with expertise, but sometimes the experts themselves disagree, so we need more principles. I'll give you two. One is no one's just like expert writ large, like on you know on their LinkedIn. If they just say hi, I'm an expert, come contact me about anything. Like nah, that's bull. You can only be an expert in particular things and particular topics. So sometimes even when we're looking at MDs, PhDs, other people with expertise, we can look at their specific degrees and their specific training. Uh, so in the case of Dr. Stephen Meyer, he's got a degree in the history and philosophy of science, which means he knows a lot more about science than I do. 
but he's going to know less about contemporary findings in biology than someone like Dr. Falk, who's uh, a biologist. So that's one principle. Sometimes you can think about who has the more relevant expertise, but sometimes people with equally relevant expertise disagree. So then we still need some other principle. Um, I think when there's massive disagreement amongst the experts, the best thing for us lay people to do is just to spend judgment. Be like, I don't know, they seem really confused about what's going on, I'm gonna let them sort it out. Um, in the case of people like Michael Beeson, uh, the reason I give less credence to their views is because there's such a tiny minority of the total body of scientists. Um, so Beeson, Meyer, and others are associated with the Discovery Institute, and the Discovery Institute put out this list where they asked any scientist if that scientist doubted evolution to sign the list. Uh, they eventually got to about a thousand, a thousand names over about a 17-year period. And a thousand names doesn't sound bad, right? But it's a really, really small fraction of total scientists. Um, what some scientists and Stephen Gopher did was they started a list called the List of Steves. The only thing you had to do was be a PhD scientist with the name Steve or Stephanie later for gender parity, and you could sign that list. That list has 1.5 as many people as the doubting evolution list. And that's obviously a very, very small slice of total scientists. So I think for me as a layperson, the best thing I can do is see what outliers, uh, the people who are given the irreducible complexity arguments are within their own fields, and look at the strong responses they get from the bulk of their colleagues. Can I respond to that quickly? Uh, I, I already did respond in a couple of ways. One, I, I the, the critic of Dr. Meyer was Dr. Falk, and I, and I offered a critique of Dr. Falk. So this goes around and around and around. Uh, but, but the other thing that I would mention is actually two things. One is that uh, when you say believe in evolution, uh, that, that's such loaded language. I'm not even sure what it means half the time. But a, but a good part of the time, uh, it is referring to uh, unguided rev, uh, e evolution, un unguided, in other words, without any kind of theistic intervention. Uh, and, and ergo, that means that somebody who has that view uh, <coughs> believes that either God doesn't exist or God has no role in, in, the, in the evolutionary process. Um, and that is consistent with the fall. I mean, we don't expect people to, scientists or others, uh, to, to have a, a predisposition toward a theistic involvement in things if they don't want to believe in God or if they don't believe in God for whatever reason. The other thing that, that, I, that I think is really helpful uh, to me, I, I was in academia, I'm, I'm retired now, I still do some, some work in, in academia, but I'm retired here at Wayne State. Uh, but I, like you, Dr. Satter, presented a lot of papers at a lot of conferences, I interacted with a lot of people in a lot of circles, and I uh, also got in, was involved, as you are, in recruiting. And it, there's a bias in the recruitment process, uh, especially in the work of science. There's a bias against People who are uh, who are theists and who uh, and who would have uh, a very critical view of evolution. That doesn't mean they can't get a job. Uh, the, we're blessed to have theists here at Wayne State on the faculty, including in the in the philosophy department, as you know. And you're kind of a theist with a small T uh, yourself. Uh, but but the point is, there is there is a hiring bias. There there is a status bias. Uh, and, and I know that sounds like a conspiracy theory. I've been around long enough to have seen it firsthand. So, so that, I, I think when you talk about consensus and how many believe this and how many sign that letter or whatever, uh, there, you gotta be careful because there's a little bit of bias in the system. I'm gonna make three really quick counter responses. The list of, to sign the list, you didn't have to be employed as a scientist. You had to write the relevant degrees. And so unless you're saying that the bias is also happening and who institutions like Wayne State are permitting to train, that's a pretty serious accusation. Second, you're relying on anecdotal sampling evidence, which I think is some evidence, but notice the points earlier in the discussion where you use that to discount some of my arguments. If we want parity here, the social science research suggests that there isn't this kind of bias. Of course, there may be bias in the research itself. They could be getting it wrong. But if we want the larger sample size, it says there really aren't these instances of this sort of like, um, uh, picking on the field. Um, I guess I'll stop there because there's so many questions. Right here. 
Okay, so I had a question that was kind of a follow-up to your choice to include scripture in your in your kind of debate for the good arguments of God. So in your defense, you were talking about um, the different interpretations of it and how it's accurate and reliable, and that's where I have issues. And I want your um, I want to hear your thoughts on it. When it was mentioned by uh, Mark Sada that testimony and and um, experiences, that is inherently um, not reliable. And even like in, just to give a real world example, um, in, in a crime scene, if there's witnesses, like if, you, if the witnesses talk to each other, they're gonna t contaminate each other's memories and memories fade after and, and deteriorate after 24 hours. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering why you think it was appropriate to include scripture that is just someone's experience of a certain thing that was written down. Not necessarily the translations, that's the issue, but that you're, relying on something that I would categorize as non-reliable and using it to say, oh, it is because of this reason that you can, uh, it can be noticeably so like, supported of X, Y, and Z about God and that this is uh, reasonable to believe. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your question. I really appreciate your really thinking about this, thinking it through, and, and you're, you're absolutely right in, in, in asking that kind of a question. Uh, it was mentioned in the introduction that I do some seminars in, in, uh, in uh, uh, CPA firms and in corporations uh, and so on. I do a lot of ethics training for executives and, and financial and accounting professionals. And uh, one of the things I like to use uh, as part of my material, my content, is the Nicomachean Ethics, which was written by Aristotle. Uh, it was written for his nephew, Nicomachus. And it's a wonderful listing of virtues and vices and how you sort of deal with understanding virtues and vices as, a, as an ethical virtue theory. It's, it's foundational. The, the most recent, the, 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 the uh, going backwards, the, the oldest copy we have is from 1400. 1400. It was written for, 400 BC, and the most recent copy has 1400 AD, uh, and yet is considered to be uh, basically a standard of, of vir virtue ethics. If you look at other uh, historical uh, documents, uh, you will find the same thing, that there, are, there is a gap of many, many years between the writing of it and the, and the version that we end up with that many years later. Uh, with the Bible, with the New Testament in particular, we have over 10,000 copies within the first 150 years. And we have them in different languages. And, uh, uh, and uh, what we have then, is, it's like the Bible went viral in, in the first century. And we have so many copies of it, and they're handwritten copies. So yeah, there are variants, and sometimes there's a spelling mistake or whatever. But we have all these other copies that we can arrive at a good idea of what the original one was. So I, uh, I would just really encourage you uh, to, 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 if you're really interested in this, is just Google reliability of the Bible, or historical reliability of the Bible, and you'll be astounded at what there is in terms of uh, achieving the text that we have. So that's the main thing. I, uh, uh, you know, I agree with the Dr. Sada that um, you're, we're not going to get clear answers on a whole lot of things in life by reading the Bible. We're sure going to get some guidance. We're going to learn the heart of God uh, by, by reading the Bible. I think it's important to distinguish two kinds of reliability. One is whether or not the words have remained the same in the text over time. Mm -hmm. So if, if the question is, do the text we have now accurately reflect the text as if they were written, mm -hmm. that would be something about the reliability of transcription and translation. So you've given a lot of arguments to think that there's a pretty high degree of reliability there. Not perfect. You know, 95 point something uh, unified means 4 point something not unified. But that's still really excellent as far as historical evidence goes. We've got great evidence that the text was pretty well preserved over time. But I'm not sure that's the kind of reliability the questioner was talking about. Another kind of reliability is whether or not the, what the writers were saying was true. The difference is we don't think Aristotle's infallible. 
And if we're treating the biblical text as infallible, there's the question of why do we treat those authors as having a special sort of access to truth that we don't think about with Aristotle or Plato or any number of other figures. I think that might have been the question. Was that the question? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, we've already talked about, uh, in fact, I, I believe Mark Sada quoted for us, 1 Timothy 3.16. Uh, the Bible uh, declares itself to be reliable in that second sense. Um, I think it's, it's profitable, which is different than reliable. But. Well, right. But, I mean, it wouldn't be profitable if it weren't reliable. So. Okay, 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 okay. Anyway. Yeah, and also reliability comes in degrees. I think you're yeah, right. As a yeah, general matter, if it was yeah. completely unreliable, not yeah, very profitable. Yeah, yeah. I'll grant you that. So, so, so um, but, but, I, but I really also, there is an experiential part of this. And the experiential part of this is open the Bible and read it. Ask God to, to open your heart to the words that are there. And it is transformative. And that, that is something that's been seen throughout history, whether it's uh, Martin Luther or Augustine or any number of people in, in the history of the church. Um, that, that reliability you, you experience, it's, 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 you, you come to understand. This is, this is the heart of God. And I'm, and I'm getting a sense of who God is as I'm going through this and, what God, and about God's love and loving kindness. Okay, I'm here on the, on the edge. My name is Kathy, and um, just referring back to her question about the Bible being reliable, it's because in the Old Testament, the prophets that was writing scriptures back then, talking about the coming of Jesus Christ and the things that was going to happen in the future, like in the book of Daniel, you won't know it unless you read it. And once you read the Old Testament on the prophecy that was coming forward, being when Jesus came to a virgin birth, it was already prophesied in the book of Isaiah. So that's why we find the Bible reliable, because the prophets that was prophesying for the future that was coming ahead, it's been fulfilled. A lot of it has already been fulfilled. So it's still more prophecy is to be fulfilled in these end times. So that's how we find the Bible reliable. And not only that, we take the uh, information outside the Bible to line it back up with the Bible to see if those things that is spoken is true. Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a response. All right. Let's um, but we know on the assumption that the New Testament text wasn't written in a way by uh, people who were familiar with the Old Testament and read it in such a way that it tells the story in a way that's familiar with Old Testament scriptures and outlines how it would have fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. Most scholars think the Gospels were written in the language between 70 and 90 CE. So that's going to be like 30, uh, well, like 40 years to 60 years after. Uh, after Christ was, was crucified. So there's just a question about what were those New Testament authors up to? Um, were the meaning that people would read the Bible the way that a lot of us do now? And that's a really tough um, question, and it's something that the biblical scholars disagree about. Yeah, it wouldn't be that, it isn't that tough in some ways, because these people died for what they wrote. Not the writers the, the, of the Gospel. The, the, we don't yeah, know who yeah, they are. Yes, well... That's a whole other question, but at the same time, we know that the disciples, the apostles, they died for the, the, the word of God that they presented. They were eyewitnesses, and they told the truth about the empty grave, and they lost their lives as a result. So there was no polishing it up to make them look good or for any other profitable reason. We can assess the motivations of people who go to their death for, for the truth that they wrote. <laughs> This, is fun. Okay, this question is for Mark. Um, someone made your shirt. Someone made that podium. You go to someone made your car. Everything at the store, someone made. And when you think of something as big as the earth and the universe, there had to be a creator, a creator that made your shirt, a creator that made your car. The earth, 
the universe is so vast and so detailed, there had to be a creator. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, so... Um, and that creator is God. We share in common is sort of like a uh, wonder at the world, right? It's pretty amazing. It's pretty beautiful. It's big and it's complicated. And what you've done is you've taken that premise. We share the premise. And from that, you've derived the conclude, conclusion that therefore it was created by God. Um, and I just don't think the conclusion follows from the premise. Um, there's this, this book called Religion Without God, written by the philosopher Ronald Dworkin. And maybe that seems contradictory to some of you, but hey, think about Buddhism, some kinds of Buddhism that don't believe in God. Um, and he said there's sort of a religious attitude one could have, all in wonder in the world, but that can be separated out from theistic belief. And he gives lots of examples of people who share an all in wonder with the world who don't conclude that God made it. There was one other part of your argument, though, an argument from analogy. You were talking about shapes, cars, podiums, and the, the idea is these things are all made, and they're less awesome than the universe. So why would we conclude that the universe wasn't made by somebody? And I think uh, it's just, it, I don't want to say that podiums are better than the universe. They're clearly not. But podiums are just a different kind of thing. We know going through the world, we've never seen a podium that wasn't made. We sort of gain inductive evidence that podiums and shirts are the sort of thing that are made. And I don't think we have the same sort of inductive evidence about the universe. The universe is sort of a one-of-a-kind thing that's a lot harder to wrap your head around. So if it wasn't God who created it, then who did? Maybe nobody did. That's a viable option. Oh. Yeah. That's a little harder to believe. Yeah, but I, I, this helps me understand your argument because one of your other premises was somebody had to make it. Why not God? Yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, Lady the Purple, but it's, it's the guy in green. You got to go with the cap. Is that the last one? Uh, my question is for Dr. Spaulding. Okay. Yes. Uh, your, according to your ranking of your argument, the two best are uh, the fine tuning and the DNA. And I think I can see how you might convince some people to believe in a God through those arguments. And I'm curious how you would then take them from a God of some kind to a Christian God specifically. Thank you. I really appreciate the question. Um, the, the tendency of all religions, and certainly the tendency of all anti-religions, anti-theists, uh, atheists, agnostics, whatever, there's a common tendency across the board, and that is to shrink God. To shrink God down to the point where I can understand God, I can, I can ask uh, impertinent questions of God and I can, and I can you know, say why, why would you allow this to happen and I can accuse God. I'm going to shrink God down to my level or something less than, than uh, what the Bible offers. The Bible grows God. The Bible shows God as just being absolutely even beyond what we, we can imagine. Yes. So tell me your question again because I, I, I'm distracting myself. I'm getting so caught up on this thing. I'm, tell me your question again. I'm just wondering how you go from oh. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. And that's, and that's it, is that, is that Christianity is, offers the biggest God and the biggest redemption of any other truth claims. So the more I learn about the fine-tuning, the more I learn about creation, as was brought up over here, uh, the bigger my idea of God gets, and the more fear, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the more wise I get, because the more fearful I get, and I become aware of the fact that God is so awesome and so huge and so holy, that is to say separate from anything that I am, that I need to fall on my face and ask forgiveness and seek a way of, of redemption through Christ. Yes. It's, it's the growing of God that leads to the message of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay, over here. Um, so in the beginning of the debate, you mentioned that um, you don't have to have God to have a, a moral standard, but if it's not God, then what is it? Can you have, still have morality if you don't have God? Isn't it just subjective at that point? Yeah, so this is a very good question. I'm surprised we haven't gotten more on this line, so thanks for bringing it up. I think uh, you can have objective moral truth uh, without God. Uh, and so part of my answer is, so uh, if you think there are objective moral truths, uh, this is a question to ask yourselves, and I might ask you in particular if you're willing to share. What is it that you think about God's existence makes morality possible? Why do you think you need to posit God in order for moral truth to exist? 
Is it because you need someone who's the arbiter? Is it because you need somebody who's all-knowing? Why would we need God for moral truth to exist? I mean, and I don't want to put you on the spot. It's okay if you don't have an answer. No, it's okay. I asked the question. I might yeah. as well be put on the spot. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you do believe in God and you think that we are fallen beings and then God is all-knowing, all-powerful, if we're using that definition, then, yeah, we need God to set the moral standard because we uh, need yeah, one yeah. person to set the moral standard. Yeah, so I think there's sort of two questions we can divide out. There's the question about whether or not moral truth could exist versus whether or not we could know what the moral truths are. Because sometimes things exist and we just don't know about them, right? So imagine a world where there's objective moral truths, but we're all oblivious to them. So what I was sort of hearing from you is that uh, part of why you think we need God in order to explain morality is you're wondering how else would we know what the moral truths are, particularly given that we're not all-knowing and not all-powerful. So part of my answer is that we don't have perfect access to moral truths. Just because I think moral truths exist doesn't mean I'm infallible in figuring out what they are. And it doesn't mean I think other people are infallible. I think we mess up and make mistakes, and sometimes we misunderstand what the moral truth is. But that's true whether or not God exists. Because even if you think God exists, it's not as if everyone who believes in God reaches all the same conclusions about what's morally right and wrong. So if God exists, he's seen fit, or they've seen fit, to let us live in a world where sometimes we still get it wrong about what moral truth is. Um, so my basic answer is whatever problem for morality someone thinks positive God solves, I don't think positive God actually solves the problem. There's two ways to think about it. One was there wasn't really a problem in the first place. Or two, we're stuck with that problem even if God exists. Okay, uh, I'm going to respond to that if I have permission from the moderator. Yes. Okay, so, um, who, oh, there we are. Thank you. I hope you don't mind me jumping in on your question. Uh, but um, so <laughs> in philosophy, we talk about an upper story and a lower story. And, 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 and the fact that since the Enlightenment, those have been kind of separated. We talk about the fact value uh, <laughs> d differentiation and things like that. Um, but uh, morality either emerges from the lower story, in other words, it comes out of nature and it tells us about pleasure and pain and things like that, that, that often do map to an evolutionary view, but doesn't, not always. Or we can talk about morality in the upper story, being conceptual. And we, we discover that, that morality works best if it's from the upper story. Because the lower story, we're, we, it, it, we just it, we begin to think about, well, what seems like a good thing, what feels good, and we begin to slop into a, uh, uh, a, a squishy kind of morality from the lower story. The upper story, how do I sort this out? And we think it through. And, and, and you, uh, as Dr. Sada has said, a lot of people are going to have a lot of different answers. They don't line up perfectly. But if you have revelation from God in the upper story, now you, can be, you have a source you can go to, some uh, uh, basically touch points you can go back to. Yeah, everybody's not always going to agree on everything, but you can look at, at, at those touch points and you can begin to converge on some very basic fundamental moralities. And so the assistance that's provided through Scripture and through the Holy Spirit is not available in the upper story any other way, and, and, but it is the way that morality can be, can be reliably construed and determined at least from my perspective. What I would say in response to that briefly is that was also an account of how we can come to know moral truths, which is different than what the grounding of moral truths is. Um, and maybe we'll get to that later, I don't know. Uh, let, let's take, sorry sir, um, we have neglected all of these questions from the chat, so can we squeeze one of those in, in front of you, the chat question, uh, an online question. We'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. All right, are you going to say it? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so the question here has the great song has a question for both. So, for Dr. Folding, what convinced you to have So, Oh, wow. I'm a, I don't know what that means. And also for Dr. Song, what convinced you to have a Since the camera's on, you can go first. Yeah, I think there's a way in which Dr. Spalding has like a static fear, and mine's still in development. But I can tell you kind of how I got to the point in the development where I am now. 
And I think it's a few things. The first thing that actually really, really bothered me as a child was I grew up in a faith tradition that uh, part of Christian was it's called exclusivist, meaning that the only way you got into heaven was if you had the right belief about God's existence. And everyone else mm-hmm. ended up in heaven. I found this really troubling to think about people all over the globe who were never told the gospel message, and I couldn't fathom how they could end up in hell forever and that could be just. This set me down on a long journey of trying to understand the Bible and where it comes from, and also trying to understand the philosophical arguments for why we have certain theological beliefs. It was the catalyst, the starting point, that eventually led me to get a PhD in philosophy because I cared about these questions so deeply. Um, And so when I found this sort of complication after complication of two types, intellectual complications around the argument, but also sorts of interpersonal complications, because I got to know people from lots of other faiths and people from no faith, and sort of heard their arguments. And I don't think there's one tradition that has the slam dunk over everybody else. Not any particular religious faith, not any particular version of a religious faith. And the same thing goes for uh, non-faith. So what do I do? I sit here doing my best to tell you my honest assessment of the arguments and the reasons I've encountered and being open to continue to learn from others. So, it, it, Tyler, is the question, uh, how, what is the question? How, it's uh, what convinced you originally? To the position that I have now? I, I'm That's assuming. That's exactly what they said. Okay. Broad, yeah, so. okay, all right. <laughs> um, so, um, I grew up in a, in a, in a high church tradition uh, and um, drifted away from it uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of them involving uh, laziness, some of them involving not wanting to be accountable, uh, 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 and whatever. Um, so the, God was really good to me because he had me do a face plan in my life. There were just a lot of things in my life that were not going well at all. And some of the most important things in my life were not going well at all. And I had the privilege of uh, having uh, someone uh, uh, walk me through a couple books in the Bible, uh, John and First John, and, and, uh, and, and I uh, realized as I was sitting reading one day uh, in Luke 16 about a, Jesus told a story of a rich man uh, who died uh, and he went to hell, I mentioned hell, he died and he went to hell, and uh, he saw Abraham and, uh, and, he, and he said, could you uh, send Lazarus, which was who was a poor man, to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, "Child, remember that your lifetime received your good thing. In your lifetime, you received good things. Lazarus, not so much." I'm moving quickly through it. Um, and besides this, there is a great chasm between heaven and hell, uh, and there's no way to cross that chasm. So. So here's, the, here's, here's the, the thing that really got me. So the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, and here's where we get to the Bible, yeah. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let them read their Bibles, was the answer. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, send them a ghost. And uh, that'll get their attention, and they will repent. And he said, and here was the answer, and here was the answer that told me that I was doomed if I did not turn to God and and receive the, the, the gift of saving grace. Here's what he said. If you do not hear Moses and the prophets, in other words, if you're, not going to, if you're not going to pay any attention to the Bible, neither will they be convinced that someone should rise from the dead. If they're not going to believe the Bible, don't bother sending them ghosts because that's not going to make any difference either. And, and I saw myself in that story in Luke 16. And, uh, and by God's grace, uh, I realized that I did need Christ and I did need the Word of God. And nothing else was going to make a difference. That's it. Okay, this gentleman here. Yep. It's for Dr. Spaulding. You answered part of my question already, but um, what's different about the Christian life? What is your life like now that you 
claim to accept Christ, what's different about it? What does your daily life look like? You know, I, I think I can answer that with one, believe it or not, with one word. Yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you don't believe me. Yeah, humility. I mean, to be submitted to Christ, to be a follower of Christ, requires some humility. To open up the Bible and yield to the truth that is there requires humility. To worship God requires humility. Uh, I, think that, I think that in my life, anyway, that's, that's the one word that I see as a, as a huge difference in my life. Are there any more chat questions? No, I just one. Can I make a short uh, point in response here? Yeah. So I think uh, something we share in common is that we both value humility. Yeah. And it's interesting to see how it sort of led us to different places. Because I think for me, part of trying to practice humility is taking really seriously the perspectives of people who disagree with me. Um, another thing of kind of how I ended up where I am in this sort of trying to figure it out space uh, was trying to listen to the stories of people from other faith traditions. And I think people who represent a lot of other religious beliefs can tell stories not in the details, but in broad strokes that look really similar about how things weren't going well in their lives, about how a friend introduced them to a religious tradition. They had a sense of truth there. They joined the tradition, and their, their world has gotten so much better. And I think for me, recognizing the parity of how that happens in different religious traditions is part of why I think sort of the humble position, at least for me at this stage in my life, is to say, I don't know. It could be so many number of things. God could be working in so many different ways. Or maybe they're not working at all because maybe they don't exist. I don't know. But for me, that aspect of intellectual humility is an important part of why I have the position I do right now. In the very back, yeah, you. Thank you. That's a very insightful question and um, troubling question. Um, the premise that I want to answer that with is Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So the first, the first blow or response, I should say, is that, um, and, and it's sometimes called, and uh, Dr. Russell uh, calls it uh, skeptical theism, uh, that, that I don't know the answer. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there, there, were, there were problems in, in the land of Canaan when the, when the, the Israelites m moved up there. There were problems in the land of Canaan. They had were steeped for 400 years in the worst kind of paganism that you could ever imagine. Uh, sacrificing children to, to, uh, to an idol, to Moloch, uh, the, the, the sexual de depravity that was rampant in the land, and just even the children brought up uh, in, in, a, in a hedonistic and, and pagan environment that, that just warped their lives from the beginning. It reminds me of, of uh, in today's world where there are, as some estimates say, 50,000 babies that are born into uh, a, a life of, of uh, human trafficking. And that they're just used for that. That's their whole their, their sole purpose. Um, so 
there, there, is a, there, there is a lot behind it. I don't understand it all, but I will say this. Uh, if you ask the question, what happens to a, a baby when they die? And if, if, if I'm told that the, when the baby dies, it goes to heaven, okay, there it is, the baby's in heaven. What happens if the, if the child has reached an age of accountability, but has adopted all of these cultural, uh, all of this paganism, all of this hatred, all of this uh, involvement in, in, in uh, a lifestyle that is just repugnant to God, uh, what happens to them? Well, there is an accountability that is there. The Canaanites, including the Ammonites, they, they did have opportunity to hear God's word. They did have an opportunity to see how God interacted with his chosen people and to learn about Yahweh in the process, and they chose not to. So there is there is there is a justice there that, that I, I put under the, under the heading of my thoughts are not your thoughts. So I haven't given you a very satisfactory answer, but I don't know the mind of God, and I'm not always satisfied myself with uh, trying to understand the way God does things. Okay. Are you trying to raise your hand, Frank? Okay. In the Wayne State sweater, sweatshirt, your turn. And this is the last question, okay? It's a really excellent question. I think it's an excellent to end up. Um, I think the first thing I can say is actually, for, for me, trying to figure out the language of what the reason is, I don't accept that premise. I think it's not uh, that we shouldn't form beliefs on the basis of faith if what we mean by faith is something like believing despite the evidence going the other way, or despite a lack of evidence, and maybe I didn't get you quite right there. But yeah, you're talking about something really interesting about religious faith. Not everybody who believes believes for the same reasons. Some people believe because they think the evidence supports it. Other people believe because they think they have maybe some sort of moral responsibility or religious responsibility to believe despite the evidence. Um, and my position is that there's, um, I'm not gonna be a believer of the latter type. And if God exists, I don't think God would ask that of me. Here's why. There's so many different religious traditions in the world. How am I supposed to know which one am I supposed to believe with lack of faith? Or it's some lack of evidence. How do I choose between the different ones? It seems like any method that would cause me to choose, say, Christianity over Islam or the reverse, would require some sort of evidence-based reasoning to decide which one to put my faith in. Um, it'd be one thing if there was only one kind of religious tradition in the world, and the question was, do you buy one or not? Maybe I'd think about it differently, but I think given religious pluralism, um, I don't see how I could choose one particular tradition based on faith. One thing I could do is sort of align myself with a particular tradition to practice um, um, spiritual submission from in hopes of discovering more religious truth. And I have sort of done that. There's a reason I got confirmed in the Episcopal Church and not some other faith. There's a way in which like, Christianity was my own for reasons of accident, reasons of birth and heritage. And it seemed an appropriate place to kind of continue this search from. Um, yeah, so that, that's my answer. Mm -hmm. This is the last one, right? That's the last so question. Is this it, our last like closing comment? Yes. OK. Uh, well, uh, and uh, then I'm going to make some. Okay, good. So my last closing comment, going back to your question, um, 
is, uh, is that uh, there are all these traditions and there are all these religions, and yes, most of them involve some idea of faith, um, but none of them have the, what, what Kathy talked to us about, none of them have this amazing 300 prophecies that come into fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. None of them have that. None of them have Jesus Christ as the center of their faith and, and the center of history. So there is a difference. So my last, my last comment uh, would be to, to say again, thank you. Thank you to Dr. Sada. Thank you, Tyler and Buck and, and um, Scott and all the others who've worked on this. Uh, I will be up here for a few minutes afterwards if you have questions. I will also be attending the next uh, Rochelle Christie meeting in 211 uh, Student Center on Monday at noon. I'm told there's going to be pizza. So, uh, so I'm every bit uh, uh, okay with pizza as anybody else. Um, the, uh, two, two other things really fast and then Dr. Sada will close. Um, uh, one is, I really meant it, uh, Mark, when I said I will pray for you in your journey seeking truth. I really mean that, and I am praying for you, and I will continue to do that. Uh, the, the last thing I'll do is just read two verses uh, that respond to this lady's question and some of the others. It's Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Thank you. I'll say two things. I'll give a, a prayer for you later that you may see the light of agnosticism, uh, and we'll see how that goes. And second, regardless of what religious faith you have or no faith, you all are thanks for having been here for almost two and a half hours. Thank you so much for your attention and your questions. Fantastic, fantastic.